Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, we have Brad Palumbo. He's back, fee.org correspondent, National Review contributor, and actually all around great guy. YouTube channel is breaking boundaries with Brad Palumbo. Brad, how are you? Hey, thanks for having me back. Thanks for being back on the show. We're gonna chop it up about minimum wage, maybe benefits, kind of the labor shortage that's happening right now in America. I don't want to presume what you know or believe about these items. So I will give you the opportunity to share with us your sentiment. Yeah, look, so we're experiencing a big labor shortage across the country. It's a very complicated problem with a ton of different factors. But I think where we probably disagree is that I believe the welfare state is playing a very big role in that and a bunch of other big government policies involved in childcare, education, and more. You know, I understand your point of view and I respect it. So I want you to follow me. This is called a linear logic exercise. You say this is part of the welfare state, and that is part of the systemic issue that has contributed at least to the labor shortage. Am I right so far? Yeah. Now, I want you to follow the why. Why are individuals on benefits programs, what you would call welfare in the welfare state based on your terminology? Why are they even why is it even necessary for them to have a connection to these programs? Well, because they're human beings and human beings respond to incentives. So in economics is all about incentives. And so for example, during COVID, many people could earn more on unemployment benefits than they could during their regular work. Mm. Obviously that had some effect discouraging work. Uh, and because people are human, and if, if I didn't have to work and could make more on benefits, or if I had options to receive things like health care and food stamps, uh, and all these things that are well intended, and many people are in need, uh, but what they do inadvertently do is discourage participation in the workforce because it's particularly acute right now. But this is not a pandemic problem. We that's had we were heading towards a labor shortage and long term issues before the pandemic. That's, that's correct. Now, Brad, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to. Cite the data that shows we had this issue coming, even pre pandemic. You've already stated that. So let me give you the linear logic that I have connected to this issue. And we're not that far off, okay? But we have a different remedy. You see, the reason why individuals um, needed the benefits programs in the first place is because one, they weren't getting paid enough at their jobs, and two, they did not have job security. And so you saw a fluctuation in the marketplace, uh, and individuals did connect to some of these programs in order to keep the lights on, to pay the mortgage. And these programs did not do a great job. It did a decent job, but it could have been done and implemented a lot better. But there's a why connected to all of this. Because based on polling data of individuals who are either looking for jobs or who have said, I'm not looking for the same kind of jobs, they have told us the reason why there's a labor shortage, okay? So let me read this. This was a survey done by Pew Research. And it said that um, they found that 48% of workers were frustrated with the search for a job. 46% said they only found openings for low paying roles, 46%, okay? So let's look at that. You're getting benefits because our corporate structure in America, our economic system does not incentivize corporations to pay you a livable wage. And so you qualify by way of government uh, protocol, you qualify for subsidy. That's the government saying, hey, we're gonna now subsidize because we realize the disparity that exists economically and the cost of living in the United States of America. So the government says, we're gonna try to solve this issue for you, okay? But the problem is that you don't get paid enough in the first place. That's the actual problem. Now, 48% of workers saying they're frustrated with the search. 46% are saying that they're only finding jobs that are low earning jobs. And so what are they doing? They're saying we're staying out of the jobs market and we're finding opportunities in gig economy and other places rather than going to secure job opportunities. 
That is something that the government by, by way of policy can start to fix and working on. I think we're close here, Brad, you don't agree with some of that connection. Yeah, so there's a couple things there, but one is in terms of jobs not paying enough, you're right, a lot of big corporations don't pay their workers enough. But a lot of these welfare programs actually act as a subsidy to these big corporations. They don't have to pay them as much because their workers, McDonald's workers can be on food stamps or other things. So in a perverted way, those actually end up benefiting corporations in a way that we really shouldn't. But we should also talk about this, which is what does it mean? to be on a welfare benefits or a many of these different programs. Well, there's different types of people and truly disabled people, you know, single moms, let I'm not talking about them. But if you are an able-bodied young man or woman and you're on unemployment benefits or all of these things and you choose not to work, you're forcing your neighbors to pay more in taxes to subsidize your idleness. And I think not only is that economically unproductive, it's morally wrong. You know, there was a survey by this from research done from the Joint Economic Committee in the Senate, and they found that pre-pandemic, this is pre-pandemic, so it's important to note, but 12% of able-bodied prime age, working age men who were not working said they were open to or looking for work, just 12%. That is a sign of a system that is broken and is enabling idleness for some people when we should be encouraging work, not discouraging it. You know, I find it interesting. You know, the average age where somebody will actually have to use unemployment benefits is at the age of 28, sometimes between 28 and 35. Okay. And that's usually because of a shift in the job market. They have this, you know, time frame where they need to find employment. We all understand that. But realize that they're paying into a taxation system that they are now able to withdraw from. Okay, they don't have savings typically to live on those savings during that duration, but they have paid in a taxation system. So when you say things like, if somebody's on unemployment, literally their neighbors are paying for them, that's incorrect. Their neighbors are not paying for them. They have already invested into that taxation system. And that taxation system, they will continue to invest in that system until the day they die or work no more, correct? So you well, have it's a little It's a little bit more complicated than that because money is fungible and not everybody is a net taxpayer. So you're right that people pay into payroll taxes and ostensibly that pays off a lot of these benefit programs. But also even if you never pay in, you can still you can still collect a lot of these benefits. And also budgetary items are fungible, right? So if the government has more money here or less money there, ultimately taxpayers pay for it all. The vast majority of individuals who receive unemployment benefits, the vast majority are individuals who have paid into the taxation system for unemployment benefits. To exist. So when you say, hey, if you're on unemployment, your neighbor is paying for you, that's incorrect. That's not true. Nine times out of 10, that's not the case. Okay? You also have contributed, but it's not as if they're taking your money and setting it aside and then giving back to you later. That's not how it works. So do you disagree with the policy of unemployment benefits as a whole, or do you just disagree with some of the misuse? Well, I definitely think that they're in it during the pandemic were much too generous. They were paying above, you know, what you could earn working in many places. I think they need to be extremely shortened in their duration. Whether we get rid of them entirely is far, we're far away from there, right? So just in terms of being pragmatic, I don't think that's very realistic, even from a free market point of view. But you know this, right? In economics, when you subsidize something, you get more of it. When you tax something, you get less of it. Right now, we tax work and subsidize unemployment. That doesn't make any sense. Now, I agree with you, people are paying in these payroll taxes. Those are regressive taxes that hurt working people. I would cut those payroll taxes so workers across America get to keep more of their paycheck. They can have savings, they can have a rainy day fund. Instead of just you know counting on maybe there's gonna be a welfare program that in the process, you know this, we've talked about this before, they lost hundreds of billions of dollars to unemployment fraud to scammers during the pandemic. They actually lost more to unemployment benefits fraud than they spent promoting and developing the COVID vaccine, which was miraculous. But that shows you how effective this government welfare can be. Well, it shows you how ineffective their ability to implement is. And so I look at it a little differently than you, and you're right. 
uh, there has been significant mismanagement of these programs. Uh, and the mismanagement that you're speaking of happened under a Republican administration. Republicans were in charge of that mismanagement. But truly, Democrats and Republicans have been in charge of massive mismanagement on both sides of the aisle. Well, a lot of so, it was at the state level too. A lot of the benefits significant, were A significant amount of Republicans and Democrats. Level. But remember, the policy was created from the federal level that allowed these rules to be exploited. So yep. without, without the rules from the federal government, which created the guidance policy, you would not have had the exploitation of these loopholes, but you did. All right, right. and you all started under Trump. I'm happy to acknowledge that. That's right, Uh, and you also had people that absolutely did not need the money, multimillionaires, who they were receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars. And if it had not been for a free press blasting them, and they returned the money, they would have gotten that money too. And the the programs were not really created for them uh, in in the uh, pandemic era. So. We got a few minutes, man, and I wanna make sure we at least touch on minimum wage because this is a debate that we don't have openly enough, okay? I am for increasing the minimum wage. Now, I have some caveat to that because I've studied this. I've studied Australia, I've studied a few other countries that have high minimum wages, right? And they do systems a little differently. They they kind of graduate. If you're a teenager, you don't get the you know maximum. You you have to graduate into that. So What are your thoughts about minimum wage increases? Because I think it resolves one of the problems we first talked about, which is the fact that people do not get paid enough money. That's why there's a dependence on some of these social benefits programs. Go ahead. Well, the minimum wage isn't the only way you can have higher wages. I, for example, I drove through New Hampshire recently visiting Dartmouth College and I went through a McDonald's where they were advertising starting at $17 an hour part time walk in interviews. They're desperate for labor. When we have competitive free labor markets, wages can be driven up on their own. New Hampshire has no minimum wage except the federal minimum wage, which is $7.25. But the McDonald's is hiring people starting at $16, $17 an hour. You don't just need a minimum wage to raise wages and minimum wages have serious consequences when there are when they're increased under the law they can cause job loss and the cost can be passed on to consumers i don't know why i'm sticking with mcdonald's today but there was research <laughs> that showed mcdonald's passed almost all of the costs of minimum wage hikes onto consumers via menu prices so i don't think working class people are necessarily left off any better when you have a higher minimum wage and that's why Places like Amazon are lobbying for a higher minimum wage. They want it because they know it's not actually going to hurt them. It will be passed on to the working class. It will hurt small businesses. So I don't actually think it's pro worker at all. All right, so let me give you my rebuttal to that. Now many smaller businesses who truly cannot afford a minimum wage increase, they will likely do to go to a contract formation of their company so that they would not be held to that liability standard. As many companies did under Obamacare, they did the very same thing, they adjusted to the market. But we've been talking about increasing the minimum wage since the 40s, okay? So I take it back to 1942. Ever since 1942, when there has been a major debate about minimum wage increases, the big corporations and typically politicians on both sides, they have said, If we do this, it is going to in fact hurt the labor market. But every time, guess what? It didn't, (laughs) every single time. There's no exception to that. Every single time we have had a minimum wage increase, the market has adjusted. Now let me read something to you about actual job loss in America. The number one killer of job, let me ask you, what do you think the number one job killer is in America? The government. (laughs) No, sir. Well, I would say based on policy, right? Policy can absolutely slow down a job market, but it's automation, brother. Automation, automation has already destroyed forever. Those jobs are never coming back. 65 million jobs where people had to be in place to do that job. Automation has already killed 65 million jobs. By 2025 to 2030, we have projected that number will rise to 73 up to 85 million jobs that will never return. To the United States of America, I, I person understand, would never but do those jobs again. I mean, the automobile destroyed millions of jobs in the stagecoach industry, right? But it created many more jobs than others. So economics isn't always a zero sum game. The fears about automation are valid, right? And we can we could talk about that. We could do a whole nother episode on that, right? That's right. But I will say that when we eliminate jobs through technological innovation and progress, we end up increasing the productive output of the economy as a whole. And everybody's output is another person's income, that's GDP. So jobs are created elsewhere in the economy. That's really interesting. 
My producers are telling me we got a couple of minutes, so let me remind you of two things. One, during the civil rights movement, there was a demand for the minimum wage to be $2 an hour. It gets overlooked, but it was part of the literature and it was part of the original proclamation made by those leaders of the civil rights movement. $2 an hour is exactly $15 an hour today when you compensate for inflation, etc. Okay, so $15 an hour minimum wage based on spending power has been on the agenda since the 60s. And let's go to 1968, the minimum wage worker earned $10.59 per hour in inflation adjusted terms, okay? So it was lower, but inflation adjusted, it was about $10.59 per hour. 46 more, 46% more than today's $7.25 federal minimum wage. The minimum wage today, if we always adjust it based on the economy, if we always adjust it based on the spending power of the dollar, the minimum wage today would be $22 an hour. We allowed them to win the narrative, brother. We allowed them to win the debate. The and real the minimum wage, have. it doesn't matter during all of that. The real minimum wage would be $0 because people can be unemployed. Uh, and the other thing that, that I'll say about that is most people don't earn that 725, almost nobody does. Even in states like South Carolina where they have no minimum wage other than that federal one in New Hampshire, less than 5% of hourly wage workers earn that, they almost all earn more. It's just a floor, the market can function without it and raise wages when you have competitive free yeah, markets. Yeah, but the abuses, brother. The abuses, and, and I know you care about those because you initially said, listen, I'm not talking about individuals who are disabled, etc. Let's talk about how corporations have abused historically lower minimum wages or no minimum wages affixed at all in order to continue making massive profits. If you don't have a regulatory system, you have extreme usury in that system. And that's not the country I wanna live in. Big gov- but, but those big businesses, they're the ones that write the regulations. Relations. They have armies of lobbyists in Washington DC, you know this. Why do you think Facebook is in my targeted ads every day telling me they want more regulation? So brother, you agree with me. Write it and they you will agree. screw over their competitors. But listen to me brother, you agree with me then that this should be a people movement. Because 59% of the American workforce, they're saying, listen, minimum wage is too low. All right, over 80% are open to the idea of changing it by way of statute, if you make the case to them, they're open to the idea. So this should be a people led movement. Right now, you have admitted it is in fact a lobbyist led movement. We gotta take that power back away from them. That's, but that's in favor of big business. Free markets empower individuals and the people. All right, brother, until next time, man. I appreciate you being on the show. All right, we'll come back, we'll chop it up about minimum wage again, okay? Thanks.